Thank you for joining me today for another teaching at Pennington AG. My name is Elizabeth, and many of you may know me already, so just a very quick introduction. My husband David and I are transplants from Massachusetts. Um, we met in high school. We started dating in 1980, got married in 1985, have three wonderful adult children, two um, wonderful son-in-laws, and four grandchildren, and one on the way overdue. So we're all sitting on pins and needles waiting for little Emerson Rose to join us. And we're just so delighted and so excited. And we just can't even believe that we're going to be grandparents to five grandchildren. Well, we are in week three of a series in the book of Psalms. And for those of you who are new to the Bible, the Psalms are right in the middle of the Bible. If you open up your Bible in the middle, you will come to the book of Psalms, give or take. Now, if you have a lot of study notes in the back, well, then you might not, but that's where it is, right in the middle. And I encourage you in this highly technological age to have a hard copy Bible. It will help you. It'll help you to learn where the books are. It'll help you to memorize scripture as you touch it and as you feel it. It'll become a part of you. And you can even write in it. I use my Bible as a journal at times and I write in the margins and I put the date there. So later I can go back and see how the Lord was speaking to me and what he was saying and how I was growing spiritually. Well, I have the wonderful opportunity to preach today on the imprecatory Psalms. And you're saying, what? What are the imprecatory Psalms? Well, I had the very same question. I had to look it up. They are curse Psalms. Yes, you heard me right. They are curse Psalms. They are Psalms that utter a curse or invoke damage or distress or disaster on someone. Sounds pretty yucky. There are approximately 15 imprecatory psalms, give or take, and they sometimes get confused with the lament psalms, which Pastor Brian preached on last week. The difference is imprecatory psalms definitely have a curse, but sometimes laments and imprecatory psalms merge together. The word imprecatory is an archaic word, that's why you've never heard of it, or probably never heard of it. It's a word we don't use anymore. The verb tense is to imprecate. To imprecate means to say things like this, and these are straight from the Bible. Break the arms of these wicked, evil people. Destroy those who look to this world for their reward. Bring shame and disgrace. Blow them away like chaff in the wind. Make their path dark and slippery. May they be like snails and dissolve into slime. Let their eyes go blind so they cannot see and make their bodies shake continually. Pour out your fury on them. Consume them with your burning anger. Okay. You get the picture, but you're probably thinking, this doesn't sound very Christian-like. Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is breathed out of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. In Hebrews 4.12 states, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Well, imprecatory prayers are certainly sharp and piercing and discerning the intentions of the heart. But the truth is, these imprecatory psalms are a gift to us. These psalms teach us that our emotions are real and we can be authentic and share our emotions with our loving Father. He is willing and capable to handle it. In fact, these Psalms are an encouragement to us to pray through all of our emotions and vulnerabilities. Praise God for that. Now, non-Christians will often ask, how can a good and loving God allow so much evil in the world? Well, these imprecatory Psalms answer that question because these psalms show us that God does indeed punish evil. And we're going to see that. 
We teach here at Pennington AG that the Bible is a unified story, both human and divine, leading people to Jesus. And we see how that happens as we move forward in this teaching on the imprecatory Psalms. Before we go further, let's pray together, shall we? Would you bow your heads? Dear Father, dear Jesus, dear Holy Spirit, we invite you into this process of this teaching. And Father, my brothers and sisters, they, they don't need to hear what I have to say. They need to hear what you have to say. So I ask you to take over the words that come from my mouth, and I ask you to prepare all of our hearts for what we are about to learn from you today. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I recently gave a book to my daughter, Aislin. She was visiting us here in Pennington, and she was asking me about the Enneagram. Now, if you don't know anything about the Enneagram, it's a personality system that helps us understand our place in the world and deal with our emotions. I had a really good book about it, so I gave it to her. A few months later, when I was visiting her in Boston, I asked her how she liked the book. Her response to me was this. I hated it, and I'm not finishing it, and I'm giving it back to you. And my response was, why? What didn't you like about it? And she said, Mom, my name was written in the margins of the pages, and I just couldn't take that. Well, we had a very good laugh about it, and I tend to do that. I tend to write people's names down in the margins of my books when I read something that reminds me of them. And I do this in my Bible as well. Remember, I told you I use my Bible as a journal, and I will write people's names down. And I will write people's names down near Scripture. That reminds me of them. When I die someday, my kids will look through my Bible, and they'll see their names written near Scripture, except for Aislinn. She will not want to be a part of that party. Anyway, my point is that I have experienced opening my Bible, coming across a psalm, and having it feed my soul or speak to my heart. And sometimes I come across an imprecatory psalm, a curse psalm, and it reminds me of someone, and I write their name down next to it. And I am sure that my name is written in somebody's Bible next to an imprecatory psalm as well. We have all felt deep emotional anguish towards others, and we can be greatly comforted by King David because he did as well. He wrote most of the imprecatory psalms. Of course, I wasn't hiding out in a cave or being pursued and chased down by someone who wanted to kill me like King David was, but still, I have experienced hurt and abuse and betrayal, and I believe if you are being honest with yourself, you could say the same. We've all been hurt in some way because we live in a broken world. I had a counselor say to me once, Elizabeth, you need to accept your humanity and the humanity of others. And that was really eye-opening for me. Humans are flawed because we live in a flawed world. Humans are flawed and broken, which means we're flawed and broken because we're human. It's best if we just admit that. It would help us to get along better with ourselves, with others, and help us to understand the imprecatory Psalms. At this point, I just want to say that I uh, don't suggest you go looking for an imprecatory psalm to pray a curse over someone. Instead, what I have found is that they usually find me. I mean, it really wouldn't be fair if we said, oh, Sally or Tommy, they really hurt me, so I'm going to go find an imprecatory psalm and I'm going to pray a curse on them. No, that is not what I am suggesting at all. Let the psalms find you. Well, at this point, we're going to look at three different ways theologians understand the precatory psalms. But first, I'm going to read one to you. So it's Psalm 35, it's 28 verses, so I suggest that you just sit back and relax while I read it. A Psalm of David. O Lord, oppose those who oppose me. Fight those who fight against me. Put on your armor and, and take up your shield. 
Prepare for battle and come to my aid. Lift up your spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Let me hear you say, I will give you victory. Bring shame and disgrace on those trying to kill me. Turn them back and humiliate those who want to harm me. Blow them away like chaff in the wind, a wind sent from the angel of the Lord. Make their path dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. I did them no wrong, but they laid a trap for me. I did them no wrong, but they dug a pit to catch me. So let sudden ruin come upon them. Let them be caught in their trap they set for me. Let them be destroyed in the pit they dug for me. Then I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be glad because he rescued me. With every bone in my body, I will praise him. Lord, who can compare with you? Who else rescues the helpless from the strong? Who else protects the helpless and poor from those who rob them? Malicious witness testify against me. They accuse me of crimes I know nothing about. They repay me evil for good. I'm sick with despair. Yet when they were ill, I grieved for them. I denied myself by fasting for them. But my prayers returned unanswered. I was sad as though they were my friends or family, as if I were grieving for my own mother. But they are glad now that I am in trouble. They gleefully join together against me. I am attacked by people I don't even know. They slander me constantly. They mock me and call me names. They snare at me. How long, O oh Lord, will you look on and do nothing? Rescue me from their fierce attacks. Protect me. Protect my life from those lions. Then I will thank you in front of the great assembly. I will praise you before all the people. Don't let my treacherous enemies rejoice over my defeat. Don't let those who hate me without cause gloat over my sorrow. They don't talk of peace. They plot against innocent people who mind their own business. They shout, aha, aha, with our own eyes we saw him do it. Oh Lord, you know all about this. Do not stay silent. Do not abandon me now. Oh Lord, wake up. Rise to my defense. Take up my case, my God and my Lord. Declare me not guilty, O Lord, my God, for you give justice. Don't let my enemies laugh about me and my troubles. Don't let them say, look, we got what we wanted. Now we will eat him alive. May those who rejoice at my troubles be humiliated and disgraced. May those who triumph over me be covered with shame and dishonor. But give great joy to those who come to my defense. Let them continually say, Great is the Lord who delights in blessing his servant with peace. Then I will proclaim your justice and I will praise you all day long. Pretty raw emotions going on there. The Psalms give us permission to share everything with God. Did you notice in this Psalm that King David curses and complains and then he praises. He curses and complains and then he praises. He curses and complains and then he praises. I encourage you to look at this psalm this week and to take notice of that. We are able to share our raw emotions with the Lord, but then we're called to praise him. Now let's take a look at three different ways theologians understand the imprecatory psalms. First, the imprecatory psalms are prophecy. They can be prayed, or maybe they shouldn't be prayed. Second, the imprecatory psalms go against the New Testament teachings of Jesus and should not be prayed. And third, the imprecatory psalms give us permission to express our emotions and thus can be prayed, and doing so is a sign of spiritual maturity. First, let's look at imprecatory psalms as prophecy. We know that the Old Testament is filled with prophecy and the Psalms are no different. The Psalms are filled with prophecy. Many theologians believe that the Psalmists were praying these prayers about Israel's future judgment and also the judgment at the end times. For future judgment on Israel, we just need to look at Psalm 1, which Pastor Brian read to us uh, the first week of this series when he was teaching for future judgment on Israel, we just need to look at Psalm 1, which is not an imprecatory psalm because it does not call down a curse, but instead expresses what will happen to the wicked and evil people at the end times. 
Pastor Brian preached on Psalm 1 in his first week of our teachings in the Psalm, but I'm just going to read through it very quickly. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. So the coming time of judgment will carry off the wicked and their deeds. As we stated earlier, this is God's plan to deal with the evil of the world. And the prophet Jeremiah reminded Judah of this when he quoted, I will scatter you like chaff that is blown away by the desert winds. And it came to be. God allowed the Babylonians to take Judah into exile for 70 years. How about future judgment at the end times? Well, let's take a look at Revelation 6. In Revelation 6, we read about the seven seals of judgment at the end times. And in Revelation 6, 9, we read about the fifth seal. And it says this, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? These martyrs gave their life for the word of God, and they wait under the altar for God to pour his judgment on the evil of this world. Their cry for God's justice follows the Old Testament imprecatory psalms. So yes, the imprecatory psalms are prophetic. They tell us about God's future judgment. Second, the imprecatory psalms go against the New Testament teachings and thus should not be prayed. If we look at Jesus' teaching in the New Testament, most especially um, the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 5, we could easily get very confused. I mean, Christians are supposed to follow the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus said, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In this way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Yes, we are called to love our enemies and pray for them. But nowhere in the scriptures does Jesus tell us we are not to express our emotions for the injustices of the world? Even Jesus did that. Soon after Jesus gives this lesson in Matthew 5, he teaches his disciples how to pray in Matthew 6. And we will see that there is a strong connection to the Lord's Prayer and the imprecatory Psalms. So let's take a moment and say the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I know many of us grew up in the church saying that every week. And we may have gotten so used to saying it and saying it so fast that we forgot the meaning in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in praying God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying an imprecatory prayer. Not only will God's peace and mercy be established, but his righteousness and his justice will also be established. That's an imprecatory prayer. Additionally, while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Now, is Jesus contradicting the Psalms? Well, James E. Adams, in his book, War Psalms of the Prince of Peace, says this, We must receive Jesus Christ in his fullness 
if we are to know him as he really is. He is the loving and merciful Savior who forgives sin, but he is also the one who is coming to judge on those who disobey his gospel. He continues, It is interesting that even in the Psalms we see both the vengeance and the love of God and perceive that these two so often assume to be enemies, but instead are truly friends in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ very profound. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes this, in his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ they will be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. Did you notice the resemblance of this New Testament scripture with the imprecatory Psalms? Jesus is indeed a forgiven Savior, but we cannot negate that he is also an awesome judge. Every time we pray the second to last verse in the entire Bible, come quickly, Lord Jesus, we are praying an imprecatory prayer. Because when Jesus does come again, there will be judgment for God's enemies. King David knew that his enemies were God's enemies. And that is what gave him the courage and the passion to pray these prayers. Now let's look at the third response about praying the imprecatory Psalms. Some theologians believe that we are given permission to express ourselves through the imprecatory Psalms and in doing so is a sign of spiritual maturity. King David had the confidence to pray shame and disgrace on his enemies because he knew his enemies were God's enemies and that God would take care of it. And this is the sign of maturity. He did not take vengeance or revenge into his own hands. Instead, he prayed to God and then he released it to God because he knew that God would take care of the matter. King David knew the Hebrew scriptures and he knew God would take care of the matter. And the same is for us today. When our enemies come against us, and maybe they're not enemies, maybe they're just people who hurt us. We have a model in the scriptures to go about prayer in an appropriate way and then to release it into God's hands. I honestly believe that if we go about this, the Lord will take care of the hurt and the pain in our life. But no, what we usually do is we go to somebody who will listen to us and we tell them that so-and-so has hurt us. And then we give so-and-so the cold shoulder. And then we never expect God to do anything in us or in them. And that's because I don't believe God will help us in that matter. We have the scriptures to show us a great model that we can go to God, we can express our emotions and our hearts, and then we can release it into God's hands and he will take care of the matter, both in our heart and in the heart of the person who has hurt us. So the imprecatory Psalms are prophetic. They do not go against the New Testament teachings and we do have permission to pray them. In the Psalms, we learn that it's okay to come to God with our hurts and our emotions, yes, even our angry emotions. Anger is a normal response when something is wrong. And even health professionals tell us that anger is part of the healing process. But I must take a quick side note here and state that we are talking about healthy anger, not rage. Rage is unhealthy anger. And I just want to say that if you struggle with rage, then please reach out to our pastor, reach out to the elders and let them come alongside you and walk you through the healing process. All of the imprecatory Psalms are an expression of healthy anger. 
for two reasons. The psalmist is talking to God about their pain and anguish and they're expressing themselves. And secondly, then they release it to God to take care of the matter. I grew up in a home with three brothers. The four of us are very close in age. My parents had four children in under four years. There were twins, but still, God bless my parents. Well, after dinner, when my mother was clearing the table and doing the dishes, my father would play games with us. And one of my favorite games was arm wrestling. I just couldn't wait to arm wrestle with my dad. My brothers and I would line up, and I was going to show my brothers how to do it. I was going to show them how to beat my dad in arm wrestling. So I have to say at this point that my dad is uh, 6'3 and weighs over 200 pounds, but this scrawny girl, she was going to beat him in arm wrestling. So when it was my turn, I took my seat at the table next to my father and I clasped his big loving hands and I looked him in the eyes and he would say to me, ready? On your mark, get set, go. And I would grab hold of his hand and I would begin to take him down. And I would look in his face and I could see he was struggling. He was really struggling. And I was pulling and pushing with all my might. And I would get one inch from taking him down and wham, he would take me down. <laughs> I never won at arm wrestling. My brothers never won at arm wrestling. My father always won at arm wrestling. Well, there was a time in my life when I was really hurt by somebody. And I was out driving in my car, and it was a dark, rainy night, and I was just yelling out at the Lord to do something about it. And I was telling the Lord what to do. I was saying, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. You get the picture. Well, then, I got this vision of arm wrestling with my father. And then I heard the voice of my heavenly father say, Elizabeth, you can complain all you want. I'm listening, but I will have my way and I will do it my way. I will win. Do you trust me? Our Heavenly Father allows us to bring our emotions to the table. He can handle it. He is right there listening and he is going to wrap his loving arms around us and he will win. He will be victorious. Our Father in Heaven allows us to cry out, yell out. He would much rather us express our emotions to him than not express them at all. He can handle it, but when we do cry out, we also need to release it, like King David did. Express our emotions and release it to God. Express our emotions and release it to God. Express our emotions and release it to God. As we close, I want to remind you that although Jesus will come back and he will judge the world of all of its injustices. He is a loving God and so willing to forgive. We are forgiven of our debts, our sins, because of what Jesus did. He took the sins of the world onto himself and he willingly went to the cross. And that's really good news. The Apostle Peter told his listeners that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now, if you have never experienced this forgiveness and peace and are ready to right now, would you pray with me? I will express the words, but make them your own while I'm praying. Would you bow your heads, please? Dear Jesus, thank you for what you did so willingly the pain and the anguish that you experienced so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and we could live in peace and have eternal life. Today I desire to walk in the fullness of that gift. Will you come into my heart? Would you walk with me and would you teach me? I thank you 
in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, if you already know Jesus, praise God. Let this week be a week that you go a little bit deeper with him, that you allow him to show you the deep and unsearchable things that are hidden inside and that he wants to reveal to you. Now, if anybody desires additional prayer, you can click the link around this video and somebody will reach out to you. Thank you for joining us for a teaching at Pennington AG. It was my privilege to share with you the imprecatory prayers.